OK, guys. Uh, OK, let's start. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this session, SEC uh, 1746 for uh, NSX Distributed Firewall Deep Dive Session. Uh, my name is uh, Francis Guillier. I am a technical product manager for NSX, working on security. And I have the great privilege to uh, present this session with uh, Subra. Uh, Subra is the dev manager for NSX. And uh, distribute firewall. Uh, he's a dev manager for distribute firewall, and distribute firewall is his uh, baby. So uh, he knows everything about distribute firewall because he implemented it. Um, this is the agenda for the session. Uh, we'll start with a brief introduction uh, on distributed firewall. So what is distributed firewall? and what is the reason that brings VMware to develop a distributed firewall. We'll then dig into a distributed firewall architecture where we will expose uh, internal components, packet flow, and traffic redirection capability. We'll then go over distributed firewall policy objects uh, in other words, which attributes you can use to write your security policy uh, and your traffic redirection rules. We'll take one micro-segmentation use case and we'll show you how to implement it. Okay, so you will see how to create security group, how to write policy rules in order to protect your intra-tier and inter-tier traffic. And then we'll end up the session with a topic about operations and best practices. So you will get five to 10 minutes at the end of the session to ask uh, questions, and we'll try to answer them. So one hour to cover fire, distributed firewall is uh, short, very short. So um, in case you need uh, more information about distributed firewall, you can attend these sessions. So the SEC 2238, the, one in, the first one in blue, uh, this is delivered by, by our product manager. Uh, and uh, he will tell you all the possible use cases for micro-segmentation using distributed firewall or using Palo Alto Network. The second session, which is the SEC 2421, talks about NSX security operations. So you will have a deep understanding on how to operate uh, distributed firewall inside this session. And if you want to have some hands-on lab uh, on distributed firewall and on Palo Alto Network, you can use the PRT 1462 uh, available on the hands-on lab uh, in Moscone uh, South. Okay. So um, what is NSX? NSX is a platform infrastructure that faithfully reproduces network and security services in software, okay? So everything you know about switching, routing, security with your physical environment, you can find it now in your virtual environment. NSX is also an open platform where third-party vendors can integrate their services VM on top of NSX. So, uh, I talk about Palo Alto Network. This is, the, uh, this, this is one of our, of our partner where you can create a Palo Alto firewall on top of NSX architecture. So management plan and control plan are fulfilled by NSX manager and NSX controllers respectively. So if you want to start using NSX, the first piece of software you need to install is NSX Manager. So once you have NSX Manager, you will be able to deploy NSX controllers. So three is the recommendation. And having NSX controllers allows you to deploy VXLAN and to use logical routing, okay? So using NSX, you can create very complex application topologies, three-tier, like, like a three-tier web app database, two-tier, four-tier, whatever you want, using these data plane components, which are logical switches, distributed logical router, 
um, edge VPN services uh, or gateway to physical. And the focus of this presentation is about distributed firewall. Okay, so it's one component inside the overall NSX architecture. So what ultimately uh, drove VMware to develop a uh, distributed firewall? So we try to understand using these slides. So when vSphere ESX was initially available on the market, the only device that a uh, customer can use to protect traffic inside the SDDC or from and to SDDC is by deploying physical firewall. Okay, so this physical firewall needs to be in the data pass for VM to VM communication. So um, people have to create complex traffic engineering rules just to send the traffic to this central firewall. So you can use VLAN stitching, you can use layer three PBR routing. The ultimate goal is to send the packet to the central firewall, okay? If the firewall doesn't see the packet, it cannot protect the network traffic, okay? So it means that uh, traffic for two VMs on two different subnets have to, this traffic needs to go through the physical firewall. And by doing that, it means that you create a kind of trombone traffic patterns. Okay, so every flow goes to the firewall and return to the other VMs, okay? And the more VMs you have in this virtual environment, the more uh, choke point the physical firewall becomes, okay? And the other thing is that the central management console for this firewall, for this physical firewall, uh, they only understand IP information. So what it means? It means that the more VMs you have in your physical environment, the more longer your policy rule table becomes, okay? So that's why we show this rule sprawl type of issue, okay? So you can start with two VMs, you have two rules, and the more VMs you add in your data center, the more longer it becomes, okay? And then it becomes complex to manage rules. And then a new generation of firewall appear on the market, and this firewall is now in VM form factor, okay? So um, you, you can have multiple type of deployment for this virtual firewall. It can be one service VM per ESXi host, or it can be one service VM per, per set of ESXi hosts. Um, virtual firewall resolve the VM to VM traffic and presented the advantage to reduce the traffic that needs to be sent to the physical, to the external physical firewall. However, the usual issue with this type of uh, uh, form factor is the performance. So up to three gig of traffic can be processed by this type of um, VM. So what we do with NSX is we bring a brand new innovation in the security space for virtual environment. So instead of uh, finding smart ways to redirect traffic to a, VM, to a firewall, what we do is we simply bring the firewall directly to the VM. So each VM that you create on NSX will have its own firewall instance. Okay, so it means that any packets that leaves or that enters a VM is processed systematically by the distributed firewall. And because we have this tight integration with vCenter, you can use any vCenter objects or attributes in your security policy configuration. So you can say, from my source, which is a VM, destination, which can be a cluster, a resource app, or it can be a vNIC, I want to allow this kind of protocol, okay? And you can even use NSX attributes, like my source is this logical switch, the web logical switch, the destination is this security group, I want to allow this particular set of protocols, okay? So by having this tight, this tight integration with vCenter, we reduce the number of rules in your security policy, and we completely resolve the security spoil type of issue. And 
uh, distribute firewall is enabled for cloud automation for two reasons. The first one is everything you do under the graphical interface, you can do it by using the REST API. So everything can be done in a very uh, programmatic way. The second uh, reason is that um, using Service Composer slash security policy, the security team can pre-build security policies and once approved, these security policies can be systematically and repeatedly deployed as many times as needed by the cloud management platforms. So you can reuse in a very easy way and in a programmatic way predefined security rules um, to protect your virtual environment. And the last thing is, this with firewall is not only a firewall. It does much more than firewalling. So what it does is it provides the capability to redirect a set of predefined traffic to a third party vendors. So for instance, I say that the traffic from this VM to this VM, I want to protect it, okay? But I want also to redirect this traffic to a third party vendor, okay? And the third party vendor does whatever it wants with this packet. And again, um, we automate this process. So using service composer slash security policy, you can define your security, your, you, you can define your traffic redirection rules and you can use this security policy as many times as you want using your cloud management platform. Okay? So um, this is the typical uh, topology when it comes to NSX and security in software-defined data center. So I've seen it many, many times during my interactions with customers. So you have this physical world and this virtual uh, software-defined data center. And the boundary is this physical perimeter firewall. So when the packet reach the virtual data center, it first cross the edge. We call it the edge service gateway. Edge service gateway has firewall capabilities. And then it goes down to the compute cluster. This is where you get your workload VM. And you can see here, each VM has its own instance of firewall. Now we need to understand the differentiation. Edge service gateway, in terms of firewalling, is used for north-south traffic. Okay, traffic that enters or exits the SDDC. Distributed firewall is used for east-west traffic. This is the component that protects your VM-to-VM -VM communication. Okay? And now, what we want to do is to show uh, quickly all the characteristics of distributed firewall on this slide. So you can see that distributed firewall is implemented at the kernel layer. So it gives the highest performance. So we say that distributed firewall is able to process packets at near land rate. You take a server with two 10 gig NIC, car, uh, NIC ports, and the measures we have done shows that we can scale up to 18 gig of traffic from server to server, okay? And it's di distributed in the sense that if you need more firewall capa capacity, just add new SXI host until you reach the limit of NSX, which is about 1,000 hosts, okay? And then um, what we do is we enable traffic redirection, as I, as I mentioned previously, and this is district firewall is the foundation for micro segmentation. You hear uh, uh, a lot, uh, many times this word, and I will show you why this is the foundation for micro segmentation. You can enable spoof guard with district firewall. Spoof guard is the capability to track an IP address with a VM. So if someone changed the IP address for this VM, by default, the traffic will be blocked until someone approves this new IP address. So spoof guard um, um, basically sticks an IP address to a virtual machine, and if someone changes it, we have the capability to detect this change. You can have identity firewall using this suite firewall. So now your access policy can be based on user ID. If I am John and I am a DB administrator, I have access to a specific set of servers for a specific set of applications. And we provide 
operations kits to monitor and troubleshoot the street firewall. And everything you do using the user interface is uh, REST uh, API capable. So basically, you can do everything using your REST API calls. Okay, back to you. Thank you, Francis. So, now Francis gave a high level overview of uh, what the distributed firewall, firewall is. Now let me go into a little bit uh, deeper uh, dive on uh, how the components are laid out and how, what is the interaction between the components and how the rules are processed and uh, stuff like that. So let me start with the distributed firewall architecture. So the essential components that we need uh, for implementing the distributed firewall are three. The vCenter server, ESXi host, obviously, and then the NSX manager. So this, this particular slide is showing you uh, the possible versions that are supported uh, for Im implementing the distributed firewall components. So as you can see, uh, we require a uh, 5.5 version vCenter server, and then we can actually support 5.5 and uh, 5.1 ESXi host. And um, of course, the NSX uh, releases 6.0 and 6.1 are, are supported. Um, and now, so if you go into, uh, uh, at, the, at a very high level, uh, uh, how, do we, how do we enable the distributed firewall? And uh, where do we enable the distributed firewall? And what kind of network uh, uh, topology that we actually need to implement the distributed firewall? So these are the three main, um, three main questions that I will be answering in this one. So let's talk about the how. So the distributed firewall, is actually enabled um, at the cluster level, and uh, the distributed firewall feature is automatically available when uh, somebody deploys the NSX. So, and then, uh, 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 it, and it's always done at the cluster level, as you can see. I mean, I have a screenshot of the vCenter UI, v NGC UI there, that shows you um, uh, when you go to the installation screens, uh, we have um, all the clusters listed out. And then there is a way to enable the distributed firewall. Um, there is a, so uh, there's a way to enable the distributed firewall, but we have to first prepare all the hosts that are actually part of that cluster. So to prepare all these hosts, um, what what we do is when we uh, 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 the necessary uh, components are actually packaged into a single um, single infrastructure bundle and are available in the NSX manager itself. And then they get downloaded automatically to all the hosts as the, uh, the host preparation happens. So as you can see, I mean, one, uh, uh, this, uh, once the installation starts, uh, starts or finishes, so there are four different modules that are actually installed on every SXA host, which are um, actually supporting switch security, VXLAN, VDR, and the distributed firewall. So all of them are together. I mean, they are all uh, available as part of the one single bundle. And then where do we actually enable the distributed firewall? So, so um, essentially, I mean, it, it's installed on every um, on the on the com compute clusters. So, in a typical data center uh, deployment on the rack deployment, so we have the computer racks, management racks, or the edge racks, or the um, other um, the service racks. Right? So, we always uh, pr uh, uh, the computer racks is where I mean you always enable the distributed firewall, but. You can, act, you can also enable the distributed firewall on the uh, management racks, but the only caveat there is you need to be careful of what you are actually protecting. You might actually shoot yourself in the foot if you don't put the vCenter server in the uh, exclude, list, exclude list of the distributed firewall. But, uh, so given that, I mean, there are some um, components, the NSX components, that distributed firewall automatically tags them as the system resource VMs, a system resource uh, VMs, and then they are automatically in the exclude list. No firewalls are actually applied, except for the case of the vCenter server. So now, um, very, uh, what kind of network dependencies do we have? So, Actually, I mean, it doesn't depend on the network at all. So it doesn't depend on what kind, you, you, do you have a VLAN, VXLAN, I mean, it doesn't depend upon that. It doesn't depend upon what kind of switches you have, what kind of switching layer, are you running with the VDS, are you running with N1KV, it doesn't matter. So, because I mean, we are actually a, um, a VNIC level firewall. That basically means we, are, we actually capture the packets that are going between the guest VMs, VNIC, and the, and the switching layer. 
So we are actually running in the IO chains of the uh, kernel. So um, it's completely independent of the transport network, and, uh, and the, uh, just because when we are tapping the packets at the network layer, all the uh, packets that are going in and out of the VM are completely inspected, and the firewall rules are actually applied on it. And then, um, uh, similar to that, and uh, the, another important point is um, the security policy, um, which are basically the rules, the combination of rules, containers, everything. So it migrated along with the VM as the VM, uh, VM moves uh, due to the vMotion and the DRS requirements. And then, so now, uh, how do we actually install it? So how do we actually configure it? How do we actually uh, orchestrate our policy? So the step number one, it's as simple as step number one and two and three. So step number one, we configure the uh, rules on the vCenter server through the NGC UI, and then which, is, which actually happens to show up, show up um, because the NSX manager installs a, uh, a plugin into the vCenter. The, it, and then um, configure the rules on it, it gets pushed down to the NSX manager, and the NSX manager has um, a, a partial management plane and a control plane kind of a functionality where it takes all those rules and pushes down to individual hosts in the cluster to which, on which we are prepping, the, prepping this firewall. So uh, on the ESXi host, I mean, we have um, a control, a partial control plane and, and full data plane implemented on the ESXi host. Now, let me go a little bit more into how, how the components are actually laid out. So as you remember, I mean, during the host preparation process, I mean, we actually uh, installs four different modules on the ESXi host. Right. So here, what we are showing, especially we are basically talking about the firewall component here, and then the components that are in the light green color and the green color are actually the, the firewall-related components. So the essential kernel uh, kernel engine is is called VSIP, which is basically VMware Service Insertion Platform. So the it has some different history to that. But anyway, so, um, and then there is a user world process that's actually installed, which is called v, v, uh, VMware um, um, Stateful Firewall Daemon. So the, uh, the daemon is, is, is at the same level as the, as the VMs, and then uh, it, it actually talks to, the, uh, talks to the kernel over an IOCTAL interface. And then the another important component that uh, is required is that red, the dark red line connection between the NSX manager and the VSRWD, which is basically a, a message bus interface that's going between the uh, VSRWD and the NSX manager. So the, it, it's, an, it's based on the Rabbit MQ, and then we actually push all the policies, rules, containers, everything through that message bus interface. So that's actually, uh, every host has a connection to the NSX manager over this um, RabbitMQ interface. So now, um, as you can see, it, um, uh, uh, the, the kernel module basically is uh, tapping all the packets that are going in and out of the guest VM. So and then the uh, uh, important point to remember is um, it actually, uh, the firewall policies are actually applied on every um, uh, on every packet that's going through the, going through that IO chain interface, so no packets are actually left without uh, without inspection. Uh, if we, to be able to find out, I mean, what kind of uh, what's the version of the soft um, uh, distributed firewall that's actually running on it? I mean, I gave a command over there which is basically going to show you what is the web version that's installed on it. And then, um, in addition to the nice functionality of the distributed firewall, the same module. Is actually um, is actually useful for um, redirecting the trap packets to the partner services. So, and um, the, it 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 you different module to be installed for the partner services. It's exactly the same module. You take that um, and the, the it's not even a different instance. It's the same instance, and then we have the ability to tap the packets at uh, different uh, um, different tap points in the I/O chains of the VM. So now. Um, as you can see, the, it, it's just an extension of the uh, uh, just an extension of the distributed firewall. And then there is a lot. There is an, um, another talk I think when, uh, that's talking uh, that's um, um, talking about uh, in detail um, 
regarding this partner services stuff. So, but at the very high level, the part, uh, all the partner services rules are, are um, created uh, through the Service Composer APIs and Service Composer UIs. And then there are all these nice um, security group abstractions that can be built into the partner services as well, in addition, uh, similar to the distributed firewall. And um, here we'll just talk about, uh, um, um, I think I can probably skip this one, but um, the essence of the essence of this is I mean, no packets are. It doesn't matter where the packets are, uh, source and destinations are. It, the, all the packets are are, are actually in, in, uh, inspected by the distributed firewall. That's what this essentially means. It's a interhost. This is basically the packet that's leaving, um, um, that's going between the um, two VMs on the same host. It doesn't matter um, uh, whether it's the same host or a different host. There are firewall rules that are that are applied on the VNIC level for every single uh, uh, tap point, and then they will be applied regardless. And then um, the, uh, similarly for the inter-host case, there there are firewall packets. Uh, there are firewall rules applied um, on the source host as well as on the destination host. So. It, it, it's protected in both, in everywhere, basically. And then, okay, this may be a little bit more involved, right? So uh, now we are actually going to look at uh, how the uh, rules are hit and how uh, we are actually creating the connection states and stuff like that. So now let's consider there are three rules in here. So uh, rule number two is what we are going to focus on right now. So it says VM1 to VM4 mean we are actually allowing the traffic, right? So let's consider the case where um, in the distributed firewall we already have a rule table and, a, and we have a connection tracker table. So the way uh, the kernel da our data structures are organized is, is that um, we have a um, set of the rules and then we have um, a huge a huge amount of memory allocated for the connections uh, that are actually going through the going through the firewall. Right. So, and then um, the rules are not exactly stored the way they are represented over there. I mean, it is just for illustration. The, the rules are actually stored in a much more efficient way. I mean, we, uh, I, uh, there are a couple of slides uh, down the line, I and mean, I can actually talk about that. So let's consider the case where we have um, three of those rules in our firewall, and then two of those connection, connections at the, at the moment. So now we are hitting the first, uh, sorry. Now we are uh, we're getting the first packet which is going from VM1 to VM4, and then, uh, uh, and, then mean, uh, and then hitting our firewall. So then what happens is, I mean, you know, oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. Uh, so the first thing that happens is, I mean, we are actually going to uh, go and look into the connection tracker table to see if there is already a connection that, are, that exists for that particular flow. We extract the, uh, we extract the tuples out of the packet, and then we actually go and check what's going. Uh, what, what do we have in our connection tracker table? And if we don't have any now, if we have that case for, now in for our current case, I mean we don't have any of the flow, so we know that we we can't hit the we can't use the connection tracker table. Now the second step is I mean we actually go and look into the rule table. We know that the step, rule number two is going to match, and the, once the rule number two matches, there uh, we are going to add a new flow um, to the connection tracker table. And, and then the new flow shows up, and then the packet is actually allowed or, del or dropped. Uh, if, if, it's actually, if, if it's going to be dropped, then we are not going to add a connection tracker entry. If it's being, because it's allowed now, so we are going to add a connection tracker entry in there. And now what happens to all the subsequent packets that are coming in? So the subsequent packets that are coming in, we are actually going to look at the root, um, connection tracker table first. We, we, we actually hit the flow number, uh, the, no, the third flow, and then we know what the action is, and then we, we just let the packet go through. Because, I mean, uh, because of this architecture, uh, and, and as we don't usually look at all the rule tables for every single packet that's going, that's going through the firewall, we can actually scale up to a very high uh, throughput rates and we have very high CPS rates. So now, the uh, uh, vMotion completely supported. We, we carry all the uh, firewall rules fire and the connection states from one source, source host to the destination host, and then um, the, all the existing connections are completely retained. 
and then it's complete, uh, and uh, the whole security policy is in, uh, independent of the VM location. Basically. And now let's talk about um, what kind of policy objects that um, the firewall rule can be created with. So um, this is the sample vCenter um, UI firewall screen, and then this has all the examples of uh, um, uh, what we can actually um, uh, create the rules with. So we can create the rules with the VC con uh, all the VC containers that we have. We, have, um, we can use the clusters, data centers, um, uh, VLANs, and then uh, we can use all the VM containers. I mean, we can create containers with the names, tags, And then uh, we can actually use uh, AD groups to create our uh, sources and the destinations. And then we can, we can use our, uh, um, uh, it, it, it's completely IPv6 compliant, and we can actually use IPv6 addresses um, as a source as well as a destination. And then I mean, there are different uh, set of the pre-canned services that are available, and then you can actually create your own service if you want to. You can pick your own protocol, um, protocol port number, I mean, source port, destination port, everything. You can, actually, you can actually create your own services, as well as you can use um, the pre-canned services. And then um, IPv6. And then uh, we, we actually support three different actions on the uh, distributed firewall and the rule action. Uh, for the rule, so allow, deny, and then the reject. So we have the ability to generate the reject packets. I mean, we generate um, uh, ICMP, ICMP rejects and uh, for the non-TCP cases and TCP reset for the TCP case, TCP close. So, and um, I think I can skip. So now uh, the rules are actually organized in two different ways. So, so one is first one is the L2 rules, and the second one is the L3 or L4 rules. We don't support the app-based rules at the moment. Um, the, on the UI, the L2 rules are uh, uh, categorized under the Ethernet, and then the uh, L3 rules are under the general section, basically. Now let's consider an example where um, uh, we, create an, we create a firewall rule with a logical, over a logical switch. Right. So let's say when we have to um, consider that rule which says okay, one so, uh, a web logical switch to the app logical switch, we are actually blocking the traffic. So that um, what, what actually happens is um, those logical switches are actually are expanded into a list of the IP addresses of the VMs of, which are connected to those switches on the ports of those switches, and then uh, the the, uh, the rule is actually pushed down to the to the to the to the kernel in the exactly same way as, it, as, is, as it's actually shown on the UI. But that table is just, a, just uh, I expanded the table only for the illustration purposes here. So it is not how the rules are actually stored in the container, in the, in the kernel. So in the, in the kernel, we actually store uh, the rule itself, which says the one security group to the another security group, we are actually uh, de denying the traffic. And then we have a um, um, security group um, containers that are actually uh, that are also configured on the kernel with the set of the IP addresses. So we know we, uh, if we are hitting that rule, we know what container to look for. We know um, um, and and still keep the memory as small uh, memory footprint as small as possible, basically. So now I mean um, now uh, the another interesting um, another interesting concept is um, using the uh, security group objects. So the way of creating the security uh, security groups usually is a very simple arithmetic, uh, which is um, uh, includes dynamic inclusion, plus static inclusion, and minus uh, static exclusion. So what that means is, in the dynamic inclusion, can uh, is kind of a regex expression. It's not complete regex, I mean it's kind of a regex. Um, you can create uh, a group with um, all the VM names. For example, I want to create a group with uh, um, uh, VM that starts with the name v, uh, uh, tiny arc, for example. Right? So you can actually create a uh, group like that, and then you can actually uh, pick um, um, uh, pick in um, uh, a specific uh, apps, uh, specific, specific logical switches, or the DBPGs, or the um, uh, IP sets, or uh, uh, Max admin, whatever you want to pick. 
So this is like a, a heterogeneous um, combination of uh, several grouping objects that we have in the v, in the V center, and then it it just forms a, a very nice abstraction layer to create a, a firewall rollout. And then let's talk about uh, once we create a firewall, uh, once we create a security group, we can uh, um, we can use uh, we can actually use that security group for um, setting up the firewall rollout. So here. Well, I'm, I'm talking about um, creating a security group with the VM name, for example. Uh, uh, let's say, I mean, um, and, the, and the tags. I think we have seen uh, usage of the security tags quite extensively these days. So that's why I included the security tag this detail as well. And that's probably much more, um, um, uh, much more flexible than the VM names per se. Um, Let's say we have the, um, we, we have some financial VMs that are um, that are getting created, and then they all start with Finweb, for example. And then you create a financial, you create a security group with VM name contains or starts with Finweb, and then or we can create a HR HR group which says okay, HR all the VMs that start with HR Web. And then, um, and then once that rule, once those security groups are created, all those security groups are kind of, are expanded into a, appropriate IP addresses sets, and then those IP address sets are actually are configured over the are configured on on, on every uh, host in that particular cluster where the firewall is actually prepped. And the, uh, I will actually talk about another nicer nicer feature which actually restricts or uh, provides more optimization for uh, distributing the firewall rules a little bit later. Um, and the, uh, similarly, for the uh, for the security tag case, I mean, you can you can create a security group which says um, uh, every VM that has this security tag, and then you, all you need to do is to, cat to uh, is to add a security tag to that VM, and then the VM gets automatically categorized into that particular security into that group. Auto uh, th those things happen um, seamlessly. And um, so. Uh, uh, this is just an example based on uh, um, uh, the security groups that we just created. So here we are talking about, um, uh, let's say we have a, uh, two, sec two logical switches, which, are, which have Windows VMs as well as the Linux VMs. Both of them have the, same, have the similar, um, similar VMs. Right? So now um, our policy says, I mean, I, I want to prevent traffic going from Windows, VM, Windows VMs to the Linux VMs. Right? So, now um, I cannot use the logical switch example, so now I will, I'll switch back to my security group uh, use case, and then I create my security groups based on the Windows VMs, and I create my security groups based on Linux VMs, and then um, it doesn't matter which logical switch they are connected to, it doesn't matter which host it's connected, which host they are running on, um, this, uh, those um, security groups are expanded into the proper IP addresses, and then they are actually pushed down on, onto the kernel, and then. Uh, that uh, table that we have shown here is just an illustration uh, of how the rules are actually applied. And um, to be able to restrict um, uh, the rules, uh, 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 to be able to restrict a rule um, to a certain set of the hosts or to a certain set of the DVPs, to a certain set of the logical switches, we have in, in another feature called apply to. In the uh, in the firewall, or when you are creating a firewall rule, you can actually pick um, a particular host, a host or a logical switch or a distributed DVPG, and you can specify that this rule should be applicable only on this um, on the on this con this construct. So that actually um, uh, restricts the scope of that rule, and that rule is not applied everywhere else in the, in the data center. You can actually pick a generic rule also, say, okay, I mean, this rule should be applied on, this, on the data center. Then that, that same rule is applied everywhere in the data center. Yeah. So we have done a lot of optimizations uh, by virtue of creating these additional constructs in the, in the management plane, and also there are a lot of optimizations on the uh, local, uh, local control plane where uh, we uh, we understand which ru which rules should be applied on which VNIX, and then we actually segregate the rules based on the VNIX, and then that's saving the space, that's saving the um, uh, that's saving the uh, rule lookups, and improving the performance, and quite a bit of that. So we do it for both the I, um, IP and the and the Macs. And now the um, in the 6.1 release uh, that we are announcing in this VM world. 
there's an additional uh, tab that's actually going to show up, which is called Partner Security Services. And that enables us to seamlessly use the same API, same UI, to even configure the partner security services. You can, um, um, and, but the only rule, the only action that's actually allowed in this case is the redirect to a particular partner service. I mean, the partner services, can, uh, partner services can be created through a, a different UI, I mean, which is called over there, I mean, the service definitions UI, or through the um, NetX APIs. And then I think there is another talk which is actually going to go more deeper into, into, that, uh, into that aspect as well. So, um, so essentially, we have. Um, I think that's it. So essentially, we have um, a, a, a seamless experience on the UI level as well as on the API level to configure the firewall rules as well as to configure the partner security services and be able to in integrate with all the partners so that we can um, we can provide a very seam uh, seamlessly in integrated, nice security policy that's applied over the uh, over a cluster level or and essentially to cater to the nicer micro segmentation use case that uh, everybody is talking about so that's all from me i think francis is going to go yes, thank you uh, subha so uh, so now that you know how distributed firewall works let's see how we can use it so this is one of the multiple uh, use cases we uh, have for macro segmentation. And you can see here this, I would say, complex topology that is created on top of NSX. It's a virtual topology. And on this virtual topology, we have one logical router that interconnects multiple logical switches. And we have a three-tier type of application, web, app, and DB. And you can see uh, on the uh, top left, a zone where we have multiple VMs with um, uh, dedicated for management and services. Okay, so this is your NMS, your syslog, NTP, DNS, and so on uh, type of workloads. So the special thing you can see here on this topology is that finance and HR share the same topology. Okay, if you try to do that with the physical network, it will be difficult. Using the virtual network and distributed firewall, it's easy to implement this type of topology. So you, we have two web servers for finance, two web servers for the, um, the HR organization, and so on. Uh, the same for app and DB. And now, um, let's see uh, how we protect the traffic. So the first thing is that any VM should be able to talk to the management and services VM, okay? Uh, this is the first rule. Um, the second one is that for intra-tier, we should protect the traffic. So it means that finance cannot talk to HR, okay? Uh, and you can put much more organizations you want on this type of topology. Um, we want to restrict the traffic that is permitted between the two organizations. However, inside a same organization, we want to enable traffic. So it means that the web uh, from HR, web server one, can talk to web server two from HR, okay? They can send ping, they can send HTTP requests if they want, but we should have some capability to enable traffic for intra-tier for the same organization. Now, what we want to do for inter-tier, so it means from web to app and app to DB uh, logical switch, we want to enable communication only for the same organization. So it means that web HR can talk to uh, app HR, app HR can talk to DB HR, but HR cannot talk to finance in no way when it comes to inter-tier traffic, okay? Um, so this is, how, uh, this is the policy rules we want to implement. The way to do that is first to create security group. So Subra explained to you how to create, how to map a VM inside a security group. For this use case, let's take something very simple and use dynamic inclusion based on, let's say, VM name, okay? So 
I create a security group, let's, let's call it the SG Fine Web for finance web servers. And I say that any VM with the name Fine-Web should be automatically included in this SG. So it means that the server team, every time they instantiate a new VM, they should put this name at the beginning or somewhere in the VM name. Okay, so if we see um, as if we see fin dash web dash one, fin dash web dash two, and so on, we know that this VM should be automatically part of the security group SG dash fin dash web. So it's a very practical way to group VMs together and to group them with the same kind of characteristics. Okay, so we create this security group. So it's two clicks with NSX, very easy to do that. And the VM will be automatically part. So it means that if you, if you destroy, if you remove a VM from your vSphere environment, the VM will disappear automatically from the security group. So there is no additional action to be done on the security group. So the most complex, honestly, for distributed firewall when it comes to micro segmentation is to define the security group. Because once you do that, now it's easy to write the policy rules. So the first thing we want to do is to change the default rule from permit to block, okay? We want to use a positive security model where we explicitly say what type of traffic we want to enable. And then the next step is, you can see here, in my policy rule, I only use security group. So for my intra-tier protection, traffic protection, I say that security group finance web can talk to security group finance web. And because the default is block, I don't need to add any rule for security group finance web to security group HR web, okay? The traffic will be automatically uh, blocked by the district firewall. So I do that for each tier and each organization, so HR web, finance app, uh, HR app, and normally I should add uh, finance DB and HR DB, okay? So this is a very simple way to protect traffic for VMs in the same tier belonging to the same organization. So now for my inter-tier uh, inter traffic, the same way, I say that web, uh, HR web can talk to HR app. So in my source, I say HR web destination, uh, uh, HR app, okay? And I specify which type of service I want to allow because I'm using a, security, a positive security model. And that's done, it's easy. The rule will look like that. And irrespective of number of VM you have in your environment, it can be very dynamic. You can add, remove VMs. The rule will be automatically applied to this VM. So now let's have a look at the uh, operations and uh, best practices. I have some slides. Uh, there is other section which cover that. So we have the airbag capability with NSX. And basically, we have four predefined rules. So you can see here, it's, it's auditor, NSX admin, enterprise admin, and security admin. Security admin is the one we are looking at. So auditor has only read-write on NSX. It, uh, sorry, read only on all NSX capabilities. Okay, it can read firewall rules, it can read service composer security group, it can only uh, read flow monitoring. The enterprise admin has full access to the whole uh, NSX infrastructure, okay? While the NSX admin is just here uh, to deploy new controllers and to prepare the host. This is uh, uh, a kind of stitching type of role. For security admin, security admin has only access to distributed firewall capability, okay? So it, the, um, the user can add delayed rules, he can uh, add delete security group, or he can uh, do things on flow monitoring, but he cannot do anything else on NSX. He cannot create a new edge, he cannot create a new logical switch, and so on. So the way to create, um, the way to map a user, a vCenter user to this role is by first creating a vCenter user, 
And then you go on NSX admin interface and you map this user with the security admin profile. In terms of uh, operations for District Firewall, we provide a toolkit. So we, have, we first have the login capabilities. Uh, so NSX manager is able to send syslog messages to a, a central server uh, for um, audit logs and for system logs. And on each ESXi host, we can send rule messages. So when you enable log on the firewall rule, we will send, um, when we see a packet that match a specific rule, we will send uh, information about this packet. Okay, rule ID, what is the action, and the number of bytes we have seen for this packet. And then we have IP fix capability. It's coming in 6.1. So you can turn on uh, IP fix, and we will send uh, IP fix tickets to a, to a server, and you will be able to see uh, the statistics about the flow that has been processed by distributed firewall. We have the flow monitoring capability. It's available on the vCenter user interface. And you can see here a, a, a set of statistics uh, uh, available for this street firewall. And then with uh, 6.1 release, we have the threshold event. So we are capable of monitoring the CPU utilization, the memory utilization, and the CPS for distributed firewall. And you can set a threshold, and if any of these um, parameters cross the threshold, we, are, we have the capability to send a syslog message and to provide a message in the audit logs. So uh, the last thing is uh, programmability. This slide is very simple in the sense that you can do everything using the REST API. You can create rules, you can delete rules, you can modify rules, you can create sections, delete sections, you can create security group, you can delete security group, you can do whatever you want using the REST API um, interface. And then uh, one slide that shows some best practices with the street firewall. So change the default rule from allow to block, okay? The second one is just enable lock for, uh, just enable rule lock only when you need, because the reason is that it consumes CPU resource. Uh, create sections to uh, clarify your policy rules. Don't forget to use exclusion list if you want to exclude VMs from a district firewall functionality. Use the apply to field to restrict the scope of rule publishing. And um, uh, use NSX security admin profile and give it to the guys who are in charge of this street firewall. And of course, use CPU, CPU memory, CPS threshold event to uh, monitor in real time your district firewall uh, environment. In terms of scale numbers, so we want to show these, uh, I would say, um, nice numbers. So we support up today up to 100,000 rules per NSX manager. Per um, VM, we support 1,000 max rules, and per EXSI host, the host itself can have up to 10,000 rules. And the connection tracker table that uh, uh, Subha talked about can support up to two million entries for, the, for one unique host. Um, and you can create up to 10,000 security group. And the number of um, hosts we support in the NSX environment is 1,000. Okay, so uh, it's a QA time now, so uh, if you have any questions, let us know. Uh, I think there are some mic. Yes. Am I audible? Okay, thank you. First of all, great presentation. Want, you want to go uh, great presentation, wanted to uh, get a broader picture and think through this. Number one, when we say distributed firewall, are we, where, does that, where does it exactly stack up against the traditional firewalls which companies like Cisco had? Do, are these going to replace them, number one? Number two, those firewalls typically had switching in hardware which was very fast. Do we plan to, uh, so how is the performance of this distributed firewall which seem to have a lot of this intelligence built into software. And third, okay, let's first go with this, then I will ask the third question. Okay, I can take. I can take that. So, um, 
uh, go, uh, uh, going back to that, uh, um, replacing the physical firewalls, I mean, I, I think the physical firewalls have a different, um, different use case compared to the distributed firewall, where the distributed firewall is more of a, um, uh, in, in the virtual data center, as uh, Francis already had that in his one, one of his slides. Um, in the uh, virtual data center to be able to take care of the east-west traffic without, without actually tromboning the flows, that's where the distributed firewall comes into picture and that's where the um, usage of the distributed firewall is. And um, uh, going, going to that performance question, so the hardware firewalls may, are, are, are still on the edge, I mean, uh, are, uh, per, are um, uh, taking care of the north-south traffic, I mean, whereas I mean, on the east-west firewall case, we, we have a limited set of the VMs that are actually running on the host, and still we can actually um, uh, scale all the way up to the line rate uh, with, with, respect to the, um, with respect to the throughput and with respect to the connections per second. So I think um, uh, the, the physical firewall case is a, a, complete, a slightly different use case compared to the east-west firewall, whereas I mean, we, we, we are actually taking care of the east-west traffic most of the time, some VM to VM traffic kind of. Thank you. I think you've already answered my third question. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I have some more nitty-gritty questions. Um, um, can you use VM folders? So a lot of people segment their different. Uh, a lot of people segment their uh, different groups using those blue folders in oh, okay, the okay, center. Okay. Uh, okay. I noticed them missing from the. Uh, inclusion list are, are they there and just omitted, or are they not possible to filter them? Um, I think the folders are still not supported. I don't exactly know the technical reason. I can find out and uh, okay. get you. Yeah. All right. Um, and then uh, the process of securing VMs, so bringing bringing VMs into uh, the DFW, the protection of the DFW. What what's that process look like? Is is there an outage for that? Is there a? I'm sorry. Is there an outage for that? Is there a suspend resume? No, 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 no. There is not. So the moment the um, uh, VM is powered on, there is a. Uh, if the cluster is actually prepped with the uh, distributed firewall, the moment VM is powered on, there is a firewall filter on it. We are not letting any single packet go through, uh, without knowing I mean what what's uh, the, what's actually passing on the wire. Okay. So and we have certain default rules that uh, that are, are pre-configured on every filter. For example. Uh, to let the DHCP traffic to go through, to let the, um, IC, um, the um, IPv6 neighbor discovery to go through. And those are the basic things that we, all, we always said uh, turn on um, on every VNIC um, by default. I mean, we attach a filter, we put the default firewall rules, and then, if, um, and then based on the policy objects, based on the policy that's configured, the rules are immediately switched to the, um, uh, the desired, desired state of the firewall. So, so I guess what I was referring to, though, is when you install the distributed, uh, the distributed firewall in a cluster that has VMs already, what, what is involved with that? So um, if, even uh, all the running VMs will automatically get the, uh, get the filter on it. Okay. The, mom the moment the host preparation is successful, they'll get the filter on it. All right, and last one really quick. Uh, the distributed firewall is a cluster uh, by cl enabled by cluster. Uh, what if you vMotion a VM out of uh, a DFW controlled area? So um, right now, I mean, the DRS boundary is actually the cluster. So, but today there is an announcement which we haven't yet uh, integrated into. Um, right now, I mean, it's uh, uh, the motion, the, the states and the um, um, the connection states and the rules are actually carried over only if the VM is moving in the DRS DRS cluster. All right. Thanks very much. Hey, uh, quick question. So. Um, it seemed like um, everything was, um, was it, all these functionalities were exposed to v, vCenter server. How much of this is exposed to vCloud director? So can I have my tenants do all this magic? So vCloud director doesn't, <laughs> doesn't expose the functionality directly, but um, it does have the firewall capabilities, which is it, it's still not um, integrated into the distributed firewall yet. OK. Thank you. Sure. It doesn't at the moment. Um, we can, we can, okay. Okay. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I think um, there is a um, there is a um, um, uh, plan for it. So I don't know the exact uh, details of the plan, but uh, we can talk about that. 
so all this logic is going on the some software engine running on the host but if uh, we are using for performance reason the SRIV kind of next uh, how do you see these firewalls evolving with uh, uh, SRIOV NICs? Okay, so uh, right now, I mean, if you have the SRIOV enabled, enabled um, the PNIC is trans, uh, tra uh, sending the packet directly to the VM, right? Yeah. So we are not actually involved. So the IO chains are, won't come into picture when, um, when there is an SRIOV path in, involved at the moment. So um, we are actually considering that uh, SRIOV feature and then probably we can address that in the upcoming releases. So uh, are you thinking of doing it uh, as a hardware-based uh, out of the host, or still thinking of putting this logic in the SRIOV NIC itself? Um, there, is an, there is a broader plan. Probably I, sh um, I will leave it to somebody else to talk about it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the question. Very minute question. Sure. The uh, ID that's one of the possible objects that can be used in a policy, is that something that is persistent over a reboot, or is it just assigned at the time of a boot up? So the ID by, by ID, you mean the tag? There's there's um, the rule VMI. name and there's rule ID. Oh, oh okay, 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 oh, that ID, okay. Yeah, so the rule ID is actually persistent. Persistent. It is persistent across the reboot, yes. Thanks. I had kind of a little bit more of a specific question also. At one point you were showing that how the connection tables are populated. How editable is that as far as connection timeouts and, and fields for, for any of those things? Say we define our own TCP service and there are certain enforcements that we want to do on that. How editable is that? So um, uh, right now it's, um, we have a REST API way to configure the, all these time modes that you, um, the, uh, for all the established sessions. So we have time modes for different uh, states of the, for example, if, the, if I consider the TCP, we have different time modes for different states of the TCP. Maybe. So if it sees a SIN, it's got a separate timeout for the amount of time it waits for the SIN act versus correct, if it's got correct. a full session open, and those are editable? Those are um, right now not editable through the UI. But um, we, uh, we have a way to um, modify it. Um, if we needed to do something custom. That, yeah, yeah. Great, thanks. Yeah. Sure. Okay, thank you.